The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 teachers in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with the Tennessee academic standards. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. This video is aligned with the following Tennessee academic standards. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you? Thank you for coming, and uh, thanks for passing the first test at MTSU, the morass of parking. Then you pass the second test. How do you find your way into a building? And then you pass the third test. How do you actually get where you're supposed to get? So, you know, you guys have already started well this morning by passing these tests. Um, you know, it's just part of the culture of MTSU, and I can say that as an MTSU alumni, and I've been here for 32 years. So uh, I've seen the campus grow and change, but those constants seem to always be with us, no matter what. Okay, now we're talking about this time in Tennessee history known as Reconstruction. And when I have talked about this in different groups, and the photo there in front of you is from the 150th Convocation of Fisk University in Nashville uh, last year where I was asked to speak, so I tried to get some picture of the crowd that was there. You know, it is a period that is really a transformative time. I often like to talk about the, what I call the Civil War era, which is really a sort of period before the war started and then also a period after the fighting had ended. Because it's all of that 15 to 20 year period that really transformed the state in many different ways. Now I can't get into all of that in 43 minutes, but uh, we'll try to cover a good bit of ground for you. Now the war in ushered in a real turbulent era. This is a truism that everyone knows. And when you think of what the Civil War achieved, you know, what was the result of the Civil War? Well, the Union had been preserved. And then you get into all the controversy. No one much uh, questions about the preservation of the Union. Yeah, the United States is still with us today. But then the doctrine of states' rights. Some said, well, the war was a repudiation of that. I still read a lot about states' rights in uh, contemporary dialogue today. So let's just say that debate was taken to a different place than what it had been before 1865. But certainly slavery had been abolished. People could not own and sell another person. But the labor question in the South had not been resolved, and that would be one of the issues of the forthcoming decades. Here we are really faced with the meat of the issue, though. Everyone recognized that slavery had been abolished. People were now free who had not been free before. But this question of equality, uh, that was a different matter. And what did that mean? African Americans felt that as they ran from plantations and farms, what I always call they sort of self-liberated themselves, they self-emancipated themselves. They didn't need to wait for a federal proclamation. They did it. They escaped to Union lines and escaped wherever to safety. They felt they were grasping the chance at equality. And I think this image from Harper's Weekly just says a whole lot. It shows an old man. It shows a dapper man. It shows a man in a Union Army uniform. And all three of those are stepping up to vote under the banner of the United States flag. Now, this is a different world, particularly here in the South. Uh, you did have free African Americans before the Civil War happened, a fact that's always important to emphasize to students. 
Uh, not all African Americans were enslaved. They were always free blacks, very small in number, but they did exist. And they did survive and thrive in the immediate post-war period. A lot of them became the first leaders because they already owned property, which is crucial in our society. If you're going to grasp political, social, and economic equality, you've got to own something to begin with. You've got to have that ground floor of entry into a democracy. So they had high hopes. They felt that now with freedom, everything else would fall into place. They could achieve what they had always knew that slavery had kept them from. And on the other hand, you had the old power elite, not only in Tennessee, but across the South. They had lost political power, certainly. Ma'am, come on in and find a seat. Oh, don't worry about it. Uh, well, we, you know, <laughs> lost and let's be found, you know. Um, so the Confederate elite who had run the South during the Civil War had lost political power. They had lost some political legitimacy. And they also faced economic uncertainty. I mean, if you look at the immediate outcome of the war, you have one group of people, African Americans, seeing it as this great opportunity. We are free at last. We can step forward and start to build. And then you've got another group of people devastated by the war. They've lost millions upon millions of dollars. They've lost their status in the old social structure. And then probably most galling to the white men of that time, they could not vote. But these newly freed slaves could. So these issues stick with us, not only in this period that we're talking about today, but for some time to come. The agency that is very much in the middle of it, as this famous political cartoon shows, was the Freedmen's Bureau, established in March of 1865. And here is the image that you see in so many textbooks and so many primary source sets and so many history exhibits in different places across the country. Um, you know, the Freedmen Bureau officer in a Union uniform is standing there with the flag draped behind him. And you have a group of cutthroats with knives and guns and a group of African Americans on the other side with not quite the same level of weapons but every side is armed and this federal agency is between the two extremes hoping to keep the peace. Now the Freedmen's Bureau was one of the primary tools of federal reconstruction. It was a federal agency that was really sort of different in American history for that time. Now we're used to this today. Federal agencies having offices in your hometown where you go to have problems resolved. I mean, this dates back to the creation of the Soil Conservation Service during the New Deal, the Social Security Administration. You have these offices. We've gotten accustomed to that over the last 70 to 80 years. But in the aftermath of the Civil War, this was something new. The idea that up here on the square in Murfreesboro and on the squares of a lot of the towns, if you come from a county seat in Tennessee, there was an office with federal officials there that sort of ran the town politically because they could met out justice, they could have people arrested, they could also sign contracts that allowed you to develop economic relationships or to hire African-American workers, they were really at the forefront of everything. So of course they were a controversial institution. And this is the image that we always see of the Freedmen's Bureau. People are a little bit hesitant to show this image. This was the counter image of how so many Confederates saw the Freedmen's Bureau as an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man. And this type of caricature image, I mean, just think of the difference of the imagery here, said a lot. And this was all about the issues that immediately came to 
the forefront in 1865 and 66. This issues of equality, of economic access, of federal power, and of states' rights. So, who was at the forefront of this? When they ask you to support Congress and you support the Negro, sustain the president and you protect the white man, well, that white man was a Tennessean, wasn't he? It was Andrew Johnson. He had been Tennessee's military governor. He became president in April 1865, so just a month after the Freedmen's Bureau creation. And he has been controversial ever since for his opposition to civil rights laws on what he saw as constitutional grounds. And he was impeached by Congress, but not convicted. He was impeached because he dare challenge Congress on the Tenure of Office Act, which was an act passed by Congress in 1868 to force the president's hand that you can't have your own cabinet officers unless we approve them. So it was a violation of separation of powers, and he ignored that act. For that reason, he was impeached, but not convicted, so he was not removed from office. Johnson, of course, was the last of the Jacksonians. You know, sometimes people get confused about the Jacksons and their role in the Civil, in the civil War, but now Johnson is the example I think our current president had in mind when he talked about, well now, Andrew Jackson was, if he had been in office, he would have stopped the Civil War. Well, Andrew Johnson tried to stop the Civil War. He was a unionist appointed by Lincoln as military governor of Tennessee once federal troops occupied Nashville in 1862. And then to have a sort of compromise candidate and for Lincoln to sort of soften his own image in the 1864 presidential election that, hey, I can govern the whole country. We can move forward as a united nation. He asked Johnson to be his vice president. Johnson was a rock rib Jacksonian and he was the last of that group of Tennessee politicians who took national prominence in the 1830s to remain important after the Civil War. So he is a very interesting person. Um, if you've never been up to the Andrew Johnson National Monument, as they call it, which is his home in Greenville, I really encourage you to go. I always feel that's just as an important national park as the Civil War battlefields, <coughs> to understand this period. Because for most of Reconstruction, and certainly in Tennessee this is true, Johnson was president. He remained president until March of 1869, not U.S. Grant, who did succeed him as president. So a Tennessean is at the helm in this controversial, difficult period. So it certainly is a momentous spring in 1865. Brownlow begins his term as governor. William Gannaway Brownlow. Now he was of the old Whig party. Hated Andrew Johnson. Absolutely hated them. Old political rivals from way back when. But they joined together as both unionists during the Civil War. And Brownlow was famous for traveling the North during the 1860s lambasting the South, lambasting its elite leadership, pretty much everything about it. He was such a strong unionist. So in many ways it became sense, it made common sense that he was nominated by the Republican Party to be governor and takes office with Johnson stepping down, of course, and um, as governor. Just two days later, Tennessee ratifies the 13th Amendment. Now that's the amendment that abolished slavery. It's the first step in the peace process. People often say, well, the Civil War ended with Grant and Lee surrender, the surrender at Appomattox. They shook hands. They were all courtly and gentlemanly. And aren't we lucky that it ended that way? Well, that's true. We are lucky. But there was a peace treaty, not ever really signed and delivered, but it was in these constitutional amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. And the first is the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. Tennessee is right at the forefront of the southern states ratifying that. 
then everything changes. Lincoln is assassinated. Johnson becomes president. Now certainly this affects the whole nation in an unbelievable way. But for Tennessee, Johnson becoming president is a lucky break because he could sort of protect his home state and protect Tennessee and we end up being the first state to be readmitted into the Union and we never go through the full sort of political uh, reconstruction that most other Confederate states did. I don't know if that happens if Johnson doesn't become president. He had that authority to do so. And then in April 26, the Army of Tennessee, the Confederate Army of Tennessee, remember there was also a Union Army of Tennessee, it surrenders. Over in North Carolina, the fighting in that sense was over, although you still have quite a bit of guerrilla activity in the state in the late spring and early summer, and then you have the trial and execution of Camp Ferguson for guerrilla activity by the U.S. Army in Nashville in October of 1865. I always think that with the Ferguson execution, you finally have the end to the killing of the actual Civil War. So these events happened. Slaves are free in Tennessee. We acknowledge the 13th Amendment, but this whole idea of equality, particularly in the polls, was still far from reality, and it was highly controversial. As this one uh, political cartoon shows here, a black man dare shows up to vote. You can see the two ballot boxes to your left, and he is surrounded by two guys with their guns, and one of them wearing, and that might be hard to see, but you can see it in the actual primary source, a CSA belt buckle. You know, you're not going to vote. And the caption down at the bottom said it all. And this is from a, a Democratic newspaper in Tennessee from this time period. Let it be known before the election that the farmers have agreed to spot every leading radical Negro in the county and treat him as an enemy for all time to come. You know, this isn't just, well, you know, this isn't just partisanship. This is an enemy for all time to come. The rotten ring must and shall be broken at any and all cost. And we have determined to withdraw all employment from our enemies. Let this fact be known. In other words, if you dare vote, you're going to be out of a job. You're not going to find opportunity. And you're trying to build something for your family if you're that black man daring to exercise his political rights. So, Reconstruction does not begin smoothly. Everyone didn't just agree that equality was a natural step, so the federal government steps in with the Civil Rights Law of 1866. Now, later civil rights laws have gotten a lot more attention throughout history, the 1875 one, and certainly the 1964 one. That's one that we all teach in classes today. But the April 66 civil rights law is interesting because it tried to get at the same concept that we have struggled with for basically the next 100 years. If you think this was passed in 66, and we really didn't get one that was finally truly enforced until 1964, that's 100 years. And it says that all persons born in the United States, except the Native Americans, you know, this is, a, this is a whole other issue about the prejudice of this time, are hereby declared to be citizens of the United States. Um, and then all citizens had full and equal benefits in all laws and proceedings for the security of their person and property. People felt this was a radical step. It was part of the now often called the Radical Republican Party. And they're moving for it and changing how things are working. This is where the phrase reconstruction comes into play. You're, reconstruction, you're reconstructing social and political arrangements that had been in place for decades. In Tennessee, the reaction was the Memphis Massacre of early May 1866. Now this is the event, if you're over from Shelby County You've heard a lot about this in the past year because the 150th anniversary of that massacre 
was sort of commemorated not only by a historical marker, but then by a symposium that we funded. Um, we wanted to support that through our program at the center of the Tennessee Civil War National Heritage Area. And we funded this symposium at Memphis to look at this event. Had, you know, two days of scholars coming in with different perspective and different research that they had done. And the result of this was horrific and portrayed in the news of the time as graphically as possible. You know, nothing like what would happen with the Watts riots or the Cleveland riots of, 18, of 1968 because of the power of television. But these are still very powerful and disturbing images here of armed whites shooting upon the homes and persons of African Americans. And then here, a white mob surrounding, celebrating the burning of a Freeman's Bureau schoolhouse. So again, that brings up images of the more recent civil rights movement, doesn't it? The burning of schools, the bombing of schools. And here you have something long before that. So the result of this was federal officials realized that fighting had stopped, but the war was not over. What seemed to really precipitate it was the fact that U.S. colored troops, now Army regulars, they had been created during the Civil War as the colored troops, they were now U.S. Army regulars, were still garrisoned at Fort Pickering, and you know, they dare walk the streets of Memphis. So this idea of armed black men in Army uniforms something that we celebrate today, well, that was just an insult. And that's what started a sort of action that was, that was supported by the police in Memphis. Ended up with over 40 people dead, many different accounts of sexual outrages, not just harassment, but rapes, but the destruction of churches and schools. Some businesses, but really the destruction of churches and schools. And to me, it sets this precedent, particularly for African-American churches, to always be symbolic targets. If you want to get a message across that you've crossed the line and you're out of place and we need to put you in your place, what do you do? You burn a church. So it led to national headlines, a congressional investigation. All of this is online through the Library of Congress. God, you can have... You can really put your classes at a high school level into this issue and see what they think about it because of all of the different testimony that is uh, readily available. But it leads to, this is May of 1866, the passage of the 14th Amendment in June of 1866. So just a month later, the 14th Amendment, which now everyone sees as one of the fundamental constitutional amendments and one that empowers all citizens in so many different ways comes from a direct result of the Memphis Massacre. Tennessee ratifies this amendment in July of 1866 and on the 24th of July 1866 Tennessee is readmitted into the Union. They had approved two of the fundamental parts of the peace treaty, the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment. Now the 15th Amendment, which guarantee African American men the right to vote, had not gotten down the line yet. They would ratify this later. All other southern states would always have to ratify all three amendments, although some struggled with that for a long time. Mississippi only ratified the 15th Amendment a couple of years ago. Um, so, you know, this is a key part of this peace treaty. Again, we never had a peace treaty, but we certainly had these constitutional amendments. Now, did that end the violence in Tennessee? No. And in fact, what you had was a really robust and violent campaign in 1867 over who would control state government. You still had so many white Confederates disenfranchised. You had what was often called the Union League or the Lincoln League. 
you know, sometimes not always called the Republican Party. These, these were more radical elements who wanted more change, and they wanted that 15th Amendment. They wanted that ability that all black men could vote. So you have riots throughout the state during that campaign. And this is something I am really have only started to research maybe in the last five years, these different incidences. And again, you can find primary sources on them, uh, particularly through that chronicingamerica.org website that the Library of Congress runs, which digitizes all these newspapers. I was part of the committee in Tennessee that selected which newspapers to digitize. And we really loaded up on s some of the small towns. We didn't want to do just the cities because, you know, it's like, well, you know, let's get all of the state represented. So you've got a lot of the smaller county seats, newspapers have been digitized, and you can go in and search this stuff and uh, find some pretty dynamite accounts of what happened. The Franklin riot took place in July of 1860. Seven, when the a white mob at the courthouse there, which still stands at the square, broke up a Union League rally, shots were fired. No one died, but there was, uh, you know, multiple accounts of uh, uh, shots being fired. The Freedmen's Bureau investigated it, and this document is also available online. And then you have the one in Rogersville, which is one that I have found particularly interesting because you get into that whole issue of how divided East Tennessee was during the Civil War. You know, one of the great myths we have is, well, you know, East Tennessee was all Unionist and the rest of the state was all Confederate. It's just not true. There's pockets of Confederates and Union supporters in all parts of the state. The fact that I always use for locals here to sort of sh wake them up is that DeKalb County, you know, next door to us here in Rutherford County, Smithville is the county seat. They had as many Union Army units from that county as they did Confederates. And they're smack dab in the middle of Middle Tennessee. So again, you've got these divisions. It's a really divided state. And Rogersville was a particularly interesting case because they had had some really bad violence during the war of just shootings of prominent citizens right there in the middle of town and everyone witnessed it, knew who did it, and nothing was done because he was either Confederate or he was either Union and it was like a feud going on big time there in Hawkins County. So here was a firefight during a political rally where you had supporters of the two candidates squaring off. And this time you did have people killed. Now these accounts, I could add in others from across the state. It was a violent election. Fighting had once again commenced. And no doubt, one of the contributing factors was the creation of the Ku Klux Klan. And particularly its role from 1866 to 1868. Now, we could talk all morning about story, you know, different accounts of how the Klan got started and what its purpose was. I get sent emails about this. I get letters about this quite often. You know, it's no doubt that they were a political group counting on domestic terrorism after they reorganized themselves in Nashville in April 1867. Exactly what was created in Pulaski by those six men meeting at this building, which still stands in Pulaski in 1866, not real sure. But certainly after 1867, you run ac across way too many primary sources, newspaper stories, federal documents, state documents. State government was trying to get a handle on who in the hell these guys were and what they were doing. So, you know, they're existing, they're shooting people, they're intimidating voters as much as anything. And in the 1867 election, probably not a major role, but certainly by 1868 they were. And this photo on the left is one that is circa 1870. It is of a Klan member from Giles County in the actual uniform. 
Now this is uniform has since, and this photo has been given to the State Museum. It has not been on display in the past, but in the new galleries that are being developed for the new State Museum, this is going to go on display. I figure it will be controversial because it is, you know, chilling just to look at it. But it also shows you how this early clan, the one from Reconstruction, was different from the clan that was reconstituted in the 1920s in, at Stone Mountain, Georgia. It's not all in the white robes with the white hoods. This is almost like a fraternal organization gone amok. And fraternal organizations were huge in Tennessee in the South and the nation in general in the late 19th century. But certainly their purpose and their intent is very clear if you just look at the evidence in the primary sources. And again, I go to contemporary newspapers accounts, the Free Rent Bureau records, state records, because in reaction, the state creates the Tennessee National Guard. It was created to combat some of these, uh, uh, the size of some of the groups. In Rutherford County, they felt that there were a thousand men in the Klan. Always a fact that they don't like to talk about in Murfreesboro like they don't like to talk about even after Reconstruction is sort of officially over. 1878, this type of, you know, extra legal justice meted out of whites against blacks were so severe, the federal government sent in two regiments to occupy Murfreesboro again, 1878. Again, found that through a primary source search. Um, it's a sort of unbelievable. And people are like, God, I've never heard that before. Well, that's one of the problems when you do history just by what you've been told. You know, often it can be valuable and interesting, but, you know, unpleasant things, this type of violence, no one wants to remember. No one wants to talk about it. So it does get forgotten. And that's where the primary sources are so valuable. So, reconstruction in politics. It's a different world. By 1868, Brownlow had the power to declare martial law in different counties, and he creates the Tennessee National Guard. And then, 1869, it all starts to change. Now, keep in mind, by this time, Tennessee has been readmitted into the Union. You know, it is sort of still ahead of the curve compared to other southern states. And Brownlow, uh, I would tend to say gets bought out. Hey, you can get out of this powder keg of being governor and be a U.S. senator. We need you in Washington. So he, he accepts it. He goes to the U.S. Senate. Federal troops had returned to selected communities, but then the state government was moving forth on a new state constitution. And the 1870 constitution, and sometimes you'll see this in old textbooks, they redeemed. They were the redeemers. They redeemed the state. They put the Confederates back into control. And it is interesting that John C. Brown, former Confederate general from Pulaski, becomes the governor. He was also the chair of this state constitutional convention. Now, one thing that they told me of uh, the teaching with primary sources guys, they didn't want me to go on and on about the state constitution of 1870. Uh, but it is fundamental. This is still the fundamental law in Tennessee is still defined by that state constitution of 1870. And I was doing a form in the last few years with a bunch of, uh, let's say, mucky mucks at the state level. And one of them said, well, don't you, you know, why do we have a situation of where the Secretary of State and all of these constitutional officers are not, you know, govern, governor appointees. Why is that? And it says the 1870 Constitution. They never wanted that executive to have the power that Andrew Johnson did as military governor and as Brownlow did as the immediate Reconstruction governor. So there's things that we deal with, both small and large, that comes out of the 1870 Constitution. And it did set in motion a new political process that would define Tennessee 
within 20 years as a real Jim Crow segregation state. Now, one thing that's interesting about this, in 1872, under the new Constitution, you finally have African-American men elected to the state legislature. Uh, Nashville Public Television has done a very good documentary on the, these, this first generation of African-American legislators. It's available at their website, which is WMPT.org. Um, you, uh, you can stream it from there. Um, you can contact the station. I still think they have some copies for distribution. Because this was an episode we had really encouraged them to do it. They had worked with me on the Civil War series during the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. And I felt this chapter needed to be looked at too. Because it was this sort of brief and shining period. 1872, black men were actually elected to the legislature. Now by, and the first one was Samson Keeble. Keeble was from Rutherford County. When he had the chance, he escaped during the Civil War to Nashville, where Union forces could, he could be safe behind the lines. He became a prosperous barber. Okay, now how does a barber become, you know, a state legislator? Think of the times. A barber was one of those positions that could be allowed for a black man. He could be a barber. So it was a profession that he could actually gain some prominence and some money from. So Keeble was the first. Uh, Samuel McElway was the last, and he was over in Haywood County and sort of forced out of office after the 1888 election. So you have this period of about 20 years, and you often think what, a, you know, I mean, in so many different ways, Jim Crow was so wrong and the segregated South was so wrong. But I always think of, you know, the opportunities thrown away. McElwee, after being chased out of Brownsville in Haywood County, well, you know, he stays there for a while and then he moves to Chicago where he becomes a very prominent businessman, starts new businesses, and you just think what a talent drain that must have happened in the state during the Jim Crow period. People could not get opportunity here, they went elsewhere and created that in other states. And that sort of gets me into this thing that I wanted to touch on some of reconstruction and economics. Because when you talk political reconstruction, you can always go, well, we were readmitted in the Union in July of 1866, so Tennessee really didn't have much of a reconstruction story. Well, I hope I've just shown you by a few examples that's not the case. Certainly, the 1870 Constitution is a benchmark, and you can say Reconstruction is over in Tennessee in 1872. But then you still have black legislators being uh, put into power for the next 20 years. So, you know, it's the political side of that gets muddled. The economic side is much the same story. You do have an impact, the end of slavery, but then a new labor system of sharecropping goes into place that in not as bad as slavery, but it's not a very fair and equitable relationships. And sharecropping in Tennessee defines rural labor in Tennessee well into the 20th century. I mean, you still find tenant houses out there on farms across the state, not as much as you did 30 years ago. These are really disappearing. But this is very much one of the outcomes of Reconstruction. Uh, blacks, was, they did not have the means to own farms. In so many counties, you know, you don't have blacks acquiring farms till, you know, 1870s, 1880s. Um, you know, it was just difficult to get the capital and to find a willing seller. And then you had to rebuild the state's infrastructure. And this is a sort of interesting story that really shapes the state. And this is how we became more industrial after the Civil War. I mean, you think of some of the big cities that developed. Memphis developed a strong industrial base. Nashville did. But think particularly of Chattanooga. It becomes a sort of iron center 
industrial center, fed by railroads as they were rebuilt. And then the copper mines at Ducktown down in the southeast corner of the state, they really boomed after the Civil War because again, rebuilding railroads, but new, mostly northern capital coming into the state to encourage that investment. And then you have the boom of new farms. Um, one project that when I uh, came to MTSU, I met with the Department of Agriculture and they wanted to work with me on creating the Tennessee Century Farms program. Don't know if any of y'all are century farmers. I was, so this was something I was very interested in doing. And one thing I, once we had the data and all of those thousand, or like 1,600 farms, one thing that's interesting, the biggest period of when these farms were created, when they started, 1865 to 1870. Biggest states are being divided up. Veterans are coming back wanting to farm the land and a whole new era in Tennessee agriculture also begins. But you know, throughout all of it, you have the impact of the Freedmen's Bureau and particularly on education. And since we're all educators here, this is where I wanted to end up. Public education in Tennessee is a radical Republican initiative started by the Freedmen's Bureau, who was providing funding and support, and then endorsed by Governor Brownlow and approved by the General Assembly. The oldest public schools out across the state, 1869 to 1870. Now, some of these still exist. The buildings still exist. They're, you know, course one-room schools. But some are bigger, like Anderson Hall there in the bottom slide, and that's at Maryville College. If you know anything about the history of Maryville College over in Blount County, you know it was always sort of different. Uh, it admitted African Americans and Indians before the Civil War. It let women come to college as well. So the Freedmen's Bureau built them that lovely three-story building, which is still the sort of mainstay building of the campus. So, and O.O. O. Howard, shown in the photo, he always felt that he owed Tennessee something because Lincoln felt that way. For East Tennessee in particular to be uh, so supportive of the Union. So towards the end of his career, and what end of his life, in the 1880s and 1890s, he works with others, not by himself, but with others, to create Lincoln University up in Harrogate. That's Claiborne County. Now, you know, that always shocks people. There's a Lincoln University in Tennessee. Yep. Started by former federal officers. And there's the second best Abraham Lincoln Museum in the country is at that college. It's the Abraham Lincoln Museum at Lincoln University. And why do they have such a great museum? Because all of these old officers gave them stuff when they created the college. So the Freeman Bureau has this long lasting impact. And then you have the African American Institutional Building. And I've already hinted at this. Churches and schools, and that was some of the first things that African Americans rushed to create, according to the historian Eric Boner. Cemeteries too. And in fact, in all of my work, and I've worked on this issue a lot over the last 20 years, newly freed blacks rushed to create safe havens. Places where they control the school, the church, and the cemetery. It was finally something under their control, and these become the basis for long-lasting neighborhoods. Now, the one on the right is a Freeman's Bureau school that then became, was also the church on Sunday. And it, it operated into fairly recent history as Henderson Chapel AME Zion Church. It's just off the town square in Rutledge. Over on the left is still a thriving community with one of the great names in Tennessee history. Created outside of Charlotte in Dixon County, 1865-66, Promised Land. And if that doesn't say it all, and it still has not the reconstruction period buildings, both the church and the school were rebuilt in the early 20th century, 
But the cemetery is there as well, and you could see I was there for, they have an annual homecoming. So these places are created, and they're still out there across the state. They're really quite fascinating to go visit. So I'll close with the one that did, does sort of take us the whole gamut. This is the Pierce Chapel AME Cemetery outside of Kingsport. Now first you always have this myth that, well, you didn't have blacks in Appalachia. Wrong. You know, they were always there. Very important part of the region's culture. And here was a place that the cemetery still existed, but the school building, which was also the church, it got torched during the civil rights movement. It was there until 18, 1965. And how did it get started? Well, this part of Sullivan County was a unionist stronghold. And an African-American man who escaped to safety behind the Union line, Jerome Pierce, came and established the community. And it's still just a cemetery there today and a couple of houses as you can see, but it's one of these sort of sacred, secular places across the state. Not much to look at maybe, but tells a powerful story. And I think that's true of Reconstruction in general. I began with an image of Fisk University's 150th convocation in 18, uh, last year, representing its long history. But then think of these other places that are in your communities across the state. They're lasting institutions as well. And that's where Reconstruction is a difficult time in Tennessee history, no doubt but it was one that transformed us and left us with institutions that still shape our lives on a daily basis. So thank you all very much. Enjoy your day here at MTSU.